in any case, um, over the last 20 years, there have been a liberalization, if you will, of the law of intellectual property. Remember we were talking about how, you know, the, uh, the, the, the tortoise and the hare. Uh, the tortoise is statutory uh, uh, construction, development, the writing of new laws, and the hare is technology. Uh, we all represent the hares, and, uh, tech about, and, and the law has really a hard time keeping up with us. Uh, over the last 20 years, in response to the you know, explosion of technology, especially in the area of uh, information technology, um, there's been a liberalization of um, what is patentable, what is protectable under intellectual property uh, rights. And so some of the recent developments include the fact that uh, the regime has been opened up to software patents and to business models. Uh, and as we uh, talked about in some of the cases we covered, uh, to uh, living uh, organisms, uh, all within a general environment marked by the relaxation of the criteria for what, what is patentable. And why is the criteria for what is patentable relaxing? Because the technology is advancing so quickly. It's hard for the law to react and to change and to adapt. And so what is patentable, the definition of what is protectable has been changing and evolving. Uh, especially in the last 20 years. And this has had an effect of causing major changes in the U.S. Uh, system of innovation, uh, more specifically in the increasing privatization of knowledge domains and activities that were previously public. Now, what do I mean by the increasing privatization of knowledge domains? Well, I can give you two examples of them. I thought I would cover both ends of the spectrum. Um, one example the good end of the spectrum is um, what Wen Ying Zhang does. What am I doing wrong? No, no, you got your mic on. I just want to make sure you have your mic. Okay, yeah, no, I got my mic. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, what do I mean by the increasing privatization of knowledge domains? Uh, and to illustrate, I'll, I'll take two examples. Uh, one example is sitting in the back of the room. I consider her and the corporation that she works for. Uh, in develops these uh, things for to be on the, uh, the good side of the equation, if you, if you know what I mean, socially. This is what we want to develop as a society. This is where we want patent law uh, to, be, um, uh, to, uh, to be liberalized. Um, uh, so over the, two, two, uh, the past two years, the first uh, 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 change or area of, that, of increasing scrutiny uh, has been the rise in the number of patent trolls. Now this is what I would consider on the other end of the patent spectrum or other end of the intellectual property spectrum. So you have scientific and um, meth methodological innovation on this end, things that actually advance us as a society, which requires or almost, um, well, requires uh, the evolution and the liberalization of uh, intellectual property protection. And then on the other end, the bad end of the, sp of the, perspective, of the uh, spectrum, at least from my perspective, are, are patent trolls. And do you, does everybody know what a patent troll is? It, 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 it's a meme that, that people of your generation are more conversant with than people of my generation. But uh, patent trolls um, scoop up a, a, a large number of patents on particular methods or ways of performing an activity, and then they sue a number of companies uh, or the licensees uh, uh, of that technology claiming that their rights have been violated. Yes, sir? Yeah, I think it's my understanding that the Lemuelson MIT program, how the way Lemuelson made his money is he was a patent troll. Well, <laughs> and I guess within, within Patent trolls, there are good patent trolls and bad patent trolls, and I guess the difference between a good patent troll and a bad patent troll is what they ultimately do with the money, maybe, right? Um, I don't know if that's true, but I'm just saying that, you know, when you see the MIT Lemuelson Prize, that's right, okay, I mean, he's making a name for himself because he made a bad name for himself by suing people. That, 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 that's really true, and I guess, and I'm not here to judge or, or to, I'm in no position to say what the difference between a good patent troll is and a bad patent troll, but I know that one of the problems that we have in intellectual property today is the abuse of intellectual property protection by patent trolls. Folks that go out and they accumulate a large number of patents and then they just sit there and look for ways to initiate litigation. 
Uh, and what that does is it destroys markets, it destroys companies, it's an enormous waste of assets for private to public. Yeah. So I was wondering, is there a mechanism you see to, to prevent that? Is it like a user phase system for initiating prop, initiating patent lawsuits or something um, of that nature? Or is it is there another alternative to balance the free flow of patents amongst companies and individuals while trying to prevent what, what you're suggesting is it's a limitation? So it's so hard because it almost requires a value judgment. You know, what's a good patent and what's a bad patent? Um, in, in a way, and that's not what the USPTO or our patent system is, is set up to do. Um, but it really almost requires a subjective value judgment. And that's why I talk about, you know, uh, good ends of the patent spectrum and bad ends. But the way to deal with it, unfortunately, is on a case-by-case -case basis. And it has to be dealt with at the initial stage with the examiner of the patent, at the patent uh, appeal trials board, and then in the, and then the, in the, and then the courts. And in this way, slowly but surely, again, it's the tortoise, um, the laws concerning what is patentable and what is not patentable, and, and the values that society wants to promote become reflected. But it's a, you know, it's, it's the problem with the system is Keeping up with it is very difficult because it, there are, the patent trolls are a lot faster. It's like cheating in sports. You know, the, 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 the people that come up with performance enhancing drugs uh, are always way out ahead of the people that uh, enforce the anti-doping laws. And that's just a fact of life. And that's and it's comparable to uh, the way technology develops and the way the law develops in, in response. So this, the second thing uh, is that there's been an increasing number of lawsuits over the topic of software patent and the question of uh, what is and what isn't patentable. Um, the central problem with software patents is in this gray area between doing X uh, on a computer, which is not patentable, uh, and the development of a new method of performing a task or function, which Wen Yin Zheng Lu does. Uh, and the question is, the pro-patent argument is that a person who discovers a new algorithm or method of doing things in, a so in software has clearly invented something that's useful and uh, novel and, in, and under Section 101 is, uh, at least on its face, uh, entitled to patent protection. Uh, the anti-patent argument is that such inventions are nothing uh, but an application of mathematics, which the Supreme Court has always said uh, are um, are in, the, are in the nature of a natural law and therefore you know, like gravity or like uh, calculating the speed of light or calculating the value of pi are not patentable. Uh, mathematics cannot be patented in the US, so why should uh, software carry patents? Well, uh, patent trolls, meanwhile, have inadvertently given a great deal of ammunition to the anti-software patent uh, advocates by launching massive lawsuit campaigns to assert ownership over such mundane, mundane tasks as connecting a computer to a network. That's actually true. Um, obviously, obvious, not novel, um, and something which under Section 101 is should not be subject to uh, intellectual property uh, protection. And companies now argue that huge numbers of patents uh, acquire huge numbers of patents specifically to use against other companies that engage in patent warfare. So there's this nuclear arms race out there uh, with companies like um, Microsoft and um, Oracle and um, uh, even Nike and uh, in that area, where they go out and acquire as many nuclear weapons or patents as possible so that they can do war, they can do, they can, they can, uh, do battle with their competitors. Uh, there's huge amounts, billions of dollars at stake, and it has prompted, uh, these developments in patent law have prompted these companies to go out and arm themselves with patents because of the proliferation of uh, litigation. Uh, this is generally seen as one reason Google acquired Motorola several years ago, uh, and Microsoft earns more from its patent licensing fees from Android than it does from Windows Phone. Um, just two really good examples of um, how these companies acquire patents uh, in order to control markets. But I thought this was an interesting um, uh, example or a graph showing um, the number of uh, 
lawsuits initiated by patent trolls over a period of time. And I think this illustrates the problem that we're having. This is one of the tensions that exist as uh, patent and intellectual property law try to seek uh, the future, uh, find, find where they need to develop. Back in 2006, uh, what were there, 2,500 patents uh, uh, cases issued a year? And look what it was two years ago. Five, nearly 5,000 patent suits and, uh, what, two-thirds of them uh, initiated by patent trolls. Um, yes, sir. Are there any statistics compiled on the outcomes, whether the patents were knocked out of the patent office or settlement or who ended up prevailing in litigation? Not that I know of, but I can tell you from personal experience walking into the federal courthouse uh, and trying cases uh, involving intellectual property that there is a tremendous hostility uh, in the federal circuits uh, towards patent trolls. And I can also tell you that by reading Supreme Court decisions, a couple of which we'll go over, um, there is hostility uh, in the courts to patent trolls. So the courts are dealing with this dichotomy, the advancement of science, the, the society's desire to reward and um, encourage technical innovation on one hand, uh, and society's uh, need to eliminate this uh, corrosive uh, force uh, on um, intellectual property law and intellectual property rights in the United States. Um, recent developments, okay, mathematical formulas. I, this is just a kind of a way of backing into our guest's uh, discussion today, but generally speaking, mathematical algorithms and formula are not patentable because they are considered a principle or a law of nature and do not meet the Patent Act definition of process under Section 101 of the of uh, the 1972 Act. However, even though a phenomenon of nature or mathematical formula may be well known, an inventive application of that principle may be patented. And this is the loophole or the daylight that's out there, uh, of course, that patent trolls have tried to uh, uh, fill, but which needs to be there, which is legitimate, uh, I think, um, when it comes to innovative uh, processes uh, or um, formula whether or not they involve uh, mathematics or, for lack of a term, natural law. Uh, you know, conversely, the discovery of such a phenomenon, like I said before, um, computing the value of pi, uh, uh, computing the speed of light, uh, those are the discovery of phenomenon uh, through mathematics, which are in, in essentially a law of nature, and that should not be um, patentable. But it's that, it's that improvement over the state of the art. If you think of a mathematical formula uh, as being a, a, or a differential equation, for instance, as being uh, state of the art, uh, if you advance the state of the art uh, and, and create a process under Section 101, have you not then created something uh, of value uh, which is novel, non-obvious, and patentable uh, under Section 101? Uh, so if a patent claim can meet the definition of a process under 101, uh, uh, it is patentable, i.e. it is the kind of thing that can receive a patent if, if it is also novel, unobvious, uh, and you know, the other things that we've gone over, the other requirements. Now the, the whole mathematics thing uh, goes back to this case called uh, Parker versus Fluke. Um, the Supreme Court held in this case that an invention that departs from the prior art only in its use of a mathematical algorithm is patent eligible only if the implementation is novel and non-obvious. Uh, Fluke had developed a process for um, uh, involving catalytic converters in automobiles. Uh, and unfortunately for old Mr. Fluke, uh, the Supreme Court said, uh, uh, used this case to talk about how uh, a mathematical algorithm could be patentable as long as it was novel and obvious, but they said to Mr. Fluke, unfortunately, your, uh, your algorithm for analyzing uh, catalytic converters doesn't happen to be novel and obvious. But this is an important case because this is the first time the Supreme Court has created that daylight, which uh, all of the modern uh, development in intellectual property law, uh, the the um, liberalization of, of what constitutes a patentable uh, uh, process uh, has, um, has derived from. 
Uh, the algorithm itself must be considered as if it were part of the prior art. So the algorithm that you're building on is a mathematical formula. That's not patentable. It's the improvement on that, on the prior art, which is patentable. So even though a phenomenon of nature or mathematical or statistical formula or other quantitative method may be well known, an inventive application of the principle may be patented. And conversely, the discovery of such a phenomenon cannot support a patent unless there is some other inventive concept in its application. Um, so in this, in this case, this fluke case, the court held that uh, not all patent applications involving patent formulas are ineligible, saying, yet it is equally clear that a process is not unpatentable simply because it contains a law of nature or mathematical algorithm. Um, thus, patents involving mathematical formulas, laws of nature, or abstract principles are eligible for protection uh, if the implementation of the principle is non-obvious uh, obvi non and, um, non and novel. Uh, unfortunately, as I said, for Mr. Fluke, uh, his uh, catalytic converter algorithm uh, was not considered uh, uh, novel. Um, now, recently, the Supreme Court had a chance to really take a stab at this and define what really is patentable out there. This was a case that was argued in 2013, and everybody had a great deal of hope for it. Uh, but thanks to uh, Justice Clarence Thomas and Justice Scalia, who wrote, who, well, uh, I, I commend the decision to you. Go out and have a look at it if you really want to see something that is absolutely incomprehensible. Uh, take a look at the, the Supreme Court decision. They had an opportunity, really, to, to, to um, put their foot on the gas as far as this development of patent law, and um, they, uh, they, they totally dropped the ball. Everybody had their hopes up when this case was argued in 2013. And, you know, it's like opening up a, a Christmas present and finding an ugly sweater, you know, that's in the wrong size. Uh, when the Supreme Court finally came down with their case, everybody was completely disappointed with, uh, with their lack of, um, shall we say, uh, vision when it came to uh, uh, defining uh, the new frontier of intellectual property law. Uh, what they did in this case is they merely reaffirmed that, uh, uh, they, they affirmed that merely adding a generic computer to perform generic computer functions does not make an otherwise abstract idea patentable. You know, that's the, uh, the Liskey case that we talked about. Uh, the case makes it clear that an abstract idea along with a computer doing what a computer normally does is not something our patent system is designed to protect. Unfortunately, the court failed to define further the boundary between abstract ideas and patent eligible implementation ideas, but it did offer guidance that should help to combat patent trolls and invalidate some of the more egregious software patents out there. The patent uh, involved in this case was you know, owned by a patent troll and so the only thing you can say this case did is it uh, uh, furthered the hostility that the federal courts have towards patent trolls without defining what really, uh, what abstract concepts uh, are patentable. So it, uh, it, it discouraged us, uh, it discouraged patent trolls without telling us what was wrong with what they were doing essentially. They narrowed, they, they decided the case on the very narrowest of terms just on the facts of that case. So it really doesn't have any application anymore. Again, the Supreme Court had a chance to jump in here and do something constructive, and it just dropped the ball. And if you really want to see why Clarence Thomas shouldn't be a Supreme Court justice, in my humble opinion, read that decision. It's like um, he doesn't care about intellectual property rights at all. Um, so that brings me to the people who really do uh, get out there on the forefront and contribute substantially to um, uh, innovation when it comes to methodologies uh, that involve natural laws like mathematics. Um, uh, Wen Ying Jing Li from uh, State Street Corporation is, uh, you, uh, you, might, uh, you might say, the uh, uh, tangible ex expression. Uh, of uh, the type of person who's on the forefront of this technology and this uh, development in the law. Um, she is um, uh, the managing director, head of risk analytics uh, for enterprise risk management at State Street Corporation. Remember, the company that's been involved in a lot of these uh, cases. And it's her job not only to develop these algorithms uh, that um, uh, reflect innovative um, uh, 
business methodologies, but it's her job to protect them. So with that, um, could we give a warm MIT welcome to Wei Min Zheng Li? First, uh, good morning, everybody, and thanks, uh, Professor Lance, for inviting me to give this, uh, 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 this talk to share my experience of uh, not to be able to pattern what, whatever we do, but to try to uh, protect the intellectual property and the confidentiality. Okay? Please jump in anytime if you have questions. Um, so, I will skip that. So before I cover the core topic of today, uh, let me give you a little bit of background introduction of the Space Ring. You probably heard about that it is, it is located in downtown Boston, that's our headquarters. And we have uh, um, uh, the reputation of being one of the largest and oldest banks in, 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 in the US. Um, our core business is uh, about the asset uh, custody and also uh, asset management. So the total assets under our custodian reached about uh, 20, more than 25 billion uh, last year, and asset and assets under our management that reached about 2.5 trillion dollars. Um, so that's kind of give you the sense of the size of, of the bank, right? And uh, we have. Uh, um, Operations in about 29 countries across four continents, and uh, we currently have more than um, 30,000 employees all over the world. Um, the major business uh, can be divided into four units: the global uh, advisor, that's our um, uh, asset uh, uh, management business, we invest on behalf of the clients. We also have global market. That's our uh, trading trading unit. We also uh, take um, a great presence in um, security finance. For example, many uh, institutional investors have the assets with space rate. We don't just sit on the assets. We actually lend out to some some firms who would like to borrow the assets. For example, a hedge fund could go to space rate, try to borrow some assets to to you know, short the market, right? To sell it. And we use the collateral uh, so, so as a protection for our potential losses. What if the hedge funds, hedge fund defaults could not pay us back? So what we could take uh, um, ex ante as protection in the name of collateral. And our third line of business is uh, global services. So basically we perform the account, uh, accounting services and also custodial business to our clients. And uh, the fourth one is global exchange. Just imagine the amount of the data, the amount of the number of clients we do business with. So we, we actually sit on a gold mine, we took the data, right? We can use the data to identify some patterns, we can sell the products to the clients, and we can, we can provide the information to other financial institutions who happen to not have what we have, right? We have trillions of dollars of assets. We could see the pattern of assets move from one class to the other. So we can use the information to identify the market trend, to identify the investors in a segment, and to use the information at our advantage by selling those to our potential clients, namely other financial institutions or, or researchers, right? So I belong to uh, enterprise risk management. My team uh, or, or, or the business units actually is the back office function. We provide risk management to the whole corporation. Uh, let me move on to tell you a little bit of uh, risk models and the intellectual pr properties. So you probably heard a, a lot, especially especially during the recent financial crisis, you know, that it was a perfect storm. Everybody contributed to the financial crisis, including banks, right? So one of the key um, identified problem from the regulator is that risk management um, at some of the largest banks was simply not adequate. Okay, so what I want to give you a little bit of background on um, uh, uh, the risk models. So since, since the um, 1980s, um, most large U.S. banks have developed internal models to measure and manage risk. 
and uh, broadly we can classify the risk of a bank, a typical bank space, uh, into two broad categories: financial risk um, and, and non-financial risk. Financial risk can usually cover market risk. For example, if we have a, a portfolio with all tradable assets, right? Say so if, if if you know you or your parents uh, you know, have a trading account with uh, some you know brokerage firm, you know they happen to have you know they bought some stocks, some bonds, right? The the stocks and bonds price could vary, right? So that's uh, typically driven by market risk. Credit risk is very simple. For example, a bank's typical function is is, is lending. If we lend our money out, we worry about whether the, the borrower could pay us back and pay up pay us back in full, right? So we we take credit risk and the interest rate risk. For example, we have a bonds and we worry about if the interest rate goes up, it goes down. You know what the bond price would go. And for non financial risk, it is it is, it is, it is a, actually it's become more and more important than financial risk. I don't know how many of you you know. Um, uh, what are the news of JP Morgan and Bank of America all got to fund billions of dollars because of their wrongdoings in, in the mortgage and writing business, right? Bank of America alone was fined 17 million, right? So those laws, those laws uh, uh, was not uh, uh, caused by, by the firm's inadequate management of market risk, credit risk, or interest risk risk. Instead, it's about the, the, um, the internal fraud and the, uh, the wrong process of, of class information. And most importantly, the uh, uh, inability to keep the class information confidential. OK. So that's kind of like a connection to what, uh, what uh, Professor Lyons just laid out. OK. I, I will, I will um, uh, um, I will add more color to, to the point that I, I just made. Okay. So the purpose of for banks to, to develop uh, uh, to develop those models is to meet both regulatory requirements and also business uh, you know, internal business division meetings. Um, you probably know that the banking industry is the most heavily regulated industry. Right, so you know why we need such a heavy regulation? Precisely because the bank can do the wrong things, right? So we could uh, break, you know, break the whole economic system down to the knee. What happened, you know, in the past you know, a few years, right? During the financial crisis, you know, how, how about uh, you know if if a bank uh, does not follow the rules, collect everybody's deposit, then run away, go to Las Vegas to gamble, right? We don't want this happening either. So that's why, you know, there's a lot of the regulation imposed on the banking industry. So all those models developed or purchased from outside um, are viewed as uh, um, uh, proprietary. That's the intellectual property of either industry or of our our um, the vendors. Okay. So it is our job, and we are held accountable to protect uh, um, the 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 intellectual properties through our uh, uh, internally uh, of our internally de developed model as well as the models we purchase from outside. Okay, so you, you may wonder why banks use models to uh, measure and manage this, right? So as, as you know, every bank in this country um, functions as a profit maximizing entity, right? It's not a, you know, honestly, I work for profit maximizing is not a charity uh, uh, organization, right? So we want to take a calculated risk so we can earn an economic return that justify the risk we take, okay? So, uh, you know, for Speed Street, uh, with such a big size, that's just uh, impossible to use a some kind of a simple calculation to see, to look at the data pattern, to get the information we need. Many times we develop the same statistical or mathematical models and try to estimate you know, what, what would happen, where is our uh, vulnerability um, a, a month from now, a quarter from now, a year from now. Okay. So developing model actually is just a, a one of the method allow us to identify the risk uh, so we can better manage the risk. Okay? Um, 
so in general, um, we we also need to meet the, meet all the regulatory requirements and the um, the U.S. regulators as well as the European regulators favor uh, model based me measurement because they believe those me measurements are more objective and, and credible, and uh, these. Uh, do not like us to use too much of expert judgment because expert judgment always can suffer from some kind of um, um, uh, opacity and also the regulator especially um, 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 are not so comfortable if expert judgment is applied to the model such that a more favorable result yield um, for the bank instead of for the for the economy, for example, if uh, um, um, we, we do we perform any trading at the stage rate, we have to hold a certain capital against, uh, say, the, the trading losses, right? So, and just think about it, we take the assets from depositors, then we, we buy stocks and uh, perform the tradings. If the trade suffer uh, a huge loss and the bank has to be closed, who will pick up the, the, the difference between the, the bank's assets and also the, the amount of money that the bank owns to the deposit, the government, right? So that's why the regulators would like the bank to have um, more objective and uh, uh, sound risk measures. So our models are truly going to perform these, those functions. Okay. So um, I, I will not do the last uh, uh, bullet point of it. I think I have already mentioned, you know, why we need those models and what are the shortcomings we um, we have identified during the financial crisis. You know, the interesting outcome of the financial crisis, at least from the regulatory side, is not, you know, is not a, you know, the elimination of the models. Instead, the regulator you know, come come to the bank and said, well, you know, your previous model perhaps you know or, or already showed that. Um, uh, they have failures um, and they cannot pick up the uh, risk when they need it the most, right? So you want to see your model, model's performance um, during the worst time, right? If, if, if that, that's the whole purpose of having a model, to see to the model is informative when you need it the model the most, right? So the regulator called us, um, you know, continue your model development and come up with a, you know, better models. So, you, you, can, you, can, you can see that after the financial crisis, um, you know, banks actually increase the model of developing, uh, development team. That, that's include my team. My team grows from you know, about uh, you know, 15 people. Now I have a team of more than 20 people. Okay. So let me give you a little bit of history of uh, general risk measurement and management. Actually, it started um, um, about uh, 100 years ago with the theory of uh, valuation of uh, uh, derivatives, and then we went through a lot of uh, the kind of uh, der derivative pricing, okay? Um, so you probably um, understand the call and uh, put option or the black Scholes formula. I, I won't dwell on that, okay? And then you can see um, uh, most recently, since 1988 until say 20, 2010, it's just one layer uh, of the other of the regulation. Each of the regulation requires the, the model development. Okay. So now let me move on to the core of the topic, which is the quantitative analysis responsibilities of maintaining um, model confidentiality. Um, as Steve mentioned before, um, for 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 modeling or mathematical formulas, the pattern law is very, and sometimes the course ruling is, is, is treated against the kind of like the intellectual property that the firms or individuals uh, try to get, right? So for those models um, we developed, uh, which are not uh, uh, subject to the, per the pattern protection, so what we do internally, we treat them as, as confidential values. We also tell our clients that's our confidential information. And we um, tell our employees that's our confidential information. So let me tell you a little bit uh, 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 about 
support my team, and they will move on to, to tell me with my team what, is, what we are required to do to keep the confidential, confidentiality, okay? So, uh, like I said, I have more than 20 people. Most of them have a PhD and master. We, we are trained in the quantitative fields from math, uh, statistics, um, um, uh, economics, um, you know, operational research, and physics. And some, yeah, some of the probably your colleagues then later on switch their careers by joining the banking industry. So that's our background. Um, internally, we, we developed the more than um, 100 uh, models to measure credit operational, uh, business risk, market risk, and the risk of the stable value graph. If, if you want me to explain more in short the terms, please, please do so, okay? And those models are directly used for both the regulatory compliance and also um, a, a sound business judgment, okay? Each of my staff members is required to keep the model confidential, and that includes the following. Keep the data we use for the model development and also our, our, our estimation method, and the model results, and where and how we use the model, and model assumptions and limitations. Um, we also, um, keep the internally and externally identified issues confidential. So internally, we have a model review team which review our models independently and they, they may identify some issues. So those issues are also confidential information. And um, we many times need to present to the regulators you know, uh, those, those, those models and show the risk measurement based on those models. Regulator may uh, find some shortcomings, or sometimes severe shortcomings of the models, and those external identified issues are also confidential information because we don't want our um, uh, competitors to know that. Okay, and uh, also if we purchase uh, a, a vendor solution, we purchase a vendor model, then it's our job to keep the vendor's model confidential. Okay. And breach of the confidentiality could include the following and share the model information even with the state street internal employees. So that's forbidden, especially share the information with somebody who has no business of knowing, knowing the model. Okay. And uh, we, you know, it, it's even worse if we share the information with the, with the external parties. And to be honest, um, the, the, um, the action we took to uh, protect us the internal information uh, didn't really separate, uh, didn't, didn't really, uh, um, separate uh, the, the leakage of information to the internal employee or external uh, parties. Okay, so that's the you know the last year's training that I just went through. Uh, in other video, we have changed everything. Okay, um, so why is why it is important um, uh, to have to treat the models as proprietary information? Like I said, that we don't want our uh, competitors to know that. And many times if we have a pricing model, it's for some um, uh, asset classes that our competitors does not have an, um, an advantage, price as fairly or accurately as we do. And then we can take the opposite position, right? So we can you know, make a sale or buy decision based on those models. And that's, that's more likely to generate a additional profit or revenue for the firm. And second is the regulatory compliance. Actually, a lot of regulatory fund is uh, um, imposed on firms uh, who has weak control, who has weak control in um, managing class information. Just think about um, if you open an account with a bank, you usually need to provide your social security number, right? So if the bank does not keep your social security number or your phone number or your, your address as confidential information, and some somebody could could you know share the, your proprietary inform, information to somebody else, if that you know doesn't matter, you know that's that's loss to 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 you directly or indirectly, you could you could have about you could uh, hold the bank accountable for the information they released, right? May not you know directly incur a, call, a, a loss to you now, but could happen in the future, right? So, and the regulator um, uh, emphasized a lot how we keep 
press confidential information as truly confidential. Okay. And uh, um, we we do uh, so many business with so many clients that we also want to present it to the clients when you know we, we ask them, you know, either to add more assets to our asset management pool or custodial asset pool. You know, if they read the Wall Street Journal almost uh, you know every quarter that's bad news on the on the front page of the of Wall Street Journal, you can imagine those clients probably do not want to do business with us, right? They wouldn't worry, you know, what happened to say the clients we, we disclose the confidential information and whether that's cost or no cost, it doesn't matter. So those potential clients probably even, think want, even do not want to talk to us, right? So we also want to uh, um, advance the science of the risk management. For example, if, if banks are allowed to enjoy the uh, intellectual property generated return, then the banks would be more likely to have incentive to develop better models, right? To do better risk management. That's why. It's so important to respect the confidential confidentiality of, of, of models. Okay, so what are the remedies that we use um, at, at Stacey? Um, first is mandatory training, and everybody uh, needs to uh, go through the um, confidentiality training and um, <coughs> client protection training every week. By the way, for for promotion, especially promotion to, to a higher senior management level, if the person failed to go through those trainings, the permission will not be approved. So, and that's the message from our CEO. So the tone is set at the top, we treat this very seriously, okay? And then we also um, uh, seek legal actions, depends on the, on the nature of the, of the, uh, the breaching. And the third is uh, uh, restricted access. So for example, you know, um, even for uh, very senior uh, managers at the state rate, um, the, that person may not have access to each floor. We, we, you probably know that the state rate downtown building has 36 floors, right? So some of the senior management could not even get access to you know, some floors that, uh, um, you know, that Perhaps you know it's not that relevant to that person's um, uh, business, or maybe have you know remote connection to that person's work. But without the legal permission, without you know security, you know sharing and and and, and checking, um, the, the senior manager could not get to any floor he or she wants to. Okay, and we also put a lot of uh, restriction on the folders. That store the information we would like to protect, and also to the systems, and also uh, to, you know, to 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 the processes. Um, I think I will stop here. I want to see if there's any questions. I have a question. Yeah. Could State Street do business as usual if you took out the analytical models that uh, your team developed? <laughs> well, what would happen to State Street if you eliminated that? Uh, uh, those methods. The, okay, my method and also how about states we could either could buy from somebody else, right? The cost usually is very high, okay? And many times, as you know, when, when a vendor develop, develops a model, there's got to be some intellectual property the vendors wants to keep. They don't want to share everything with us because we could you know, replicate whatever they do, right? Then basically, basically we take, we take away that Profit generating uh, uh, know how, right? So we could buy from uh, an external vendor, but we would have only limited in information or knowledge of his model. So you'd have okay. to, you, you, if you didn't have them, you'd have to acquire them. I have to and, acquire them. And that's because it's essential for State Street's existence right. uh, to have these models. Right, or we don't have an internally developed model either. And the regulator could come in, basically tell us, you know, we don't have uh, uh, knowledgeable staff members, staffs to manage the risk. They can break the state street entity into small pieces. They can force us to um, do very simple business, or they can shut down because we don't have adequate risk management in place. Yeah. 
So the question really, it's not, gonna, it's not gonna be a very good question, but how long do your models last? Which is really, how fast is the market moving? Okay, it's, it's a okay. very good question. It depends on the, on the business. Sometimes we retire the business, so that there will be a natural retirement of the model, right? right? But I think that the core of your, your question is more about the, the ongoing uh, business process and how long the model should, should be updated. Right. For, for how frequent the model should be updated. Right. To be honest, uh, internally, we at least uh, for the kind of low, big change business, we update uh, every year. But at the same time, we have uh, the model usage uh, division and the model review division and uh, the user feedback uh, uh, mechanism. So even the model uh, development is, is not updated as you know, we put the model into production. But all those business units would collect the information, so the model would take a look along the along the say the, the the month when the model put into production. If there's any identified shortcomings, and then there will be a um, uh, whole new process of model development and model assessment. So then you know we also built uh, the flexibility into the model try to. Uh, uh, make the model forward looking by using different scenarios right. and to see and each scenario if that could happen you know that could if, if that happened in the future what are the models outcome would be and and uh, the models output reliable or not reliable and to what extent we should apply expert overlay and, and apply it in the more conservative way So how long does it take to run these models? Are these supercomputer models or are these PC models or? Um, we have a whole IT system to support the model run, and it depends on the uh, complexity of the models. Some can take uh, 24 hours because um, uh, you probably uh, remember I mentioned I mentioned our security finance business, but we, we are the largest player in the security finance, security finance business. And the, the portfolio is um, seven hundred billion dollar dollars with all the tradable securities. So in order to run that the value at risk, so that, that that's basically a fancy term to see uh, and what probability the loss would you know at this at a, a particularly defined confidence interval, right? I think probably you have some statistical training background now. So it, it doesn't See, and what conditions the loss would breach a certain number, okay? So for that model, with the securities worth about 700 billion, it takes one day to run the model. So it's very inefficient. So to be honest, the the market changes so much, right? Remember during the financial crisis, stock price and, and the, the volatility of the market shoot up so much, stock price dropped down so much. So we, we actually need a minute by minute you know, monitor of the, of the portfolios. Because once we learn the, the securities out, we worry about whether you know, the security really worth as, as much as the collateral we take in. If, if we you know, worth much less than the collateral, probably you know, we should go after the plans. I can, I can give one little story to the students from an engineering point of view. About 15 or 20 years ago, um, J.P. Morgan built 60 Wall Street. It's like 80 story, 60 story building with 60 yeah. Wall Street. And then they looked at it and they realized that it had been fast paced construction and some of the welds they had made and the cooling of the, of the air conditioning system uh, may, may fail. And they looked at the reliability of this. I remember they told me that if they lost their computer system at J.P. Morgan, they would lose a billion dollars a minute. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. We, we also, uh, these days, we put a lot of emphasis on cyber security because we believe that's the only thing that can bring back now. So, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Wen Ying. Okay. Um, by the way, um, I finished at the top of her class at uh, Nanjing University, which is the MIT of China, PhD from uh, uh, Columbia. She couldn't get into a good school, but the fastest PhD in economics uh, in, in history of Columbia. 
Um, if you want to follow in her footsteps, or if you know anybody who is, wants to follow in Wen Yi's footsteps, um, I think that uh, uh, you can let us know because, especially if you have a colleague who's looking for a summer internship, wants to, who's into this kind of stuff, let us know. All right, last thing I would say is if um, her algorithms aren't patentable, one, the, one of the other things that they can do is they can um, copyright these things. Microsoft still retains the copyright on the code for Windows. Oracle still has a copyright on Java. And it would be illegal to copy a State Street Risk Management algorithm program without appropriate license. So there is protection out there. Next week, uh, finish up on copyrights. We're going to have a copyright lawyer here to check on Friday. Then we're going to do uh, business models.